Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back from break. Especially, you're back from break in the afternoon. I'm really happy to see you here. Um, we will begin now, and I have the grand pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Rosalind in October. Uh, she is the former VP of Behavioral Programs and a former assistant professor at SUNY Empire State College in New York, USA. Dr. Rosalind, otherwise known as Rose October, has been in the healthy profession for 30 years. And for 11 and a half years, Rose was an assistant professor in the School of Human Services at State University of New York, Empire State College in Brooklyn, where she taught and mentored adult learners. Prior to that, she held directorship positions in substance use treatment agencies that involved the criminal justice system. In addition, she has published articles and book chapters that really address substance use, migration, and other social work related topics. Furthermore, for many years, she was a visiting lecturer at Social Work Unit at the University of Guyana, right here in GT. And she has trained social workers and probation officers of the Ministry of Human Services in Guyana. We certainly look forward to what we will learn from Dr. October today. And without further ado, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Denton. What a pleasure it is for me to be here this afternoon with you. And I hope that uh, we learn from each other. I really hope so. So I want to go through what I'll cover this afternoon. And the overview says I'll do a quick introduction, then the effects of the pandemic on mental health and substance use, the related trauma of substance use and its consequence of delinquency, education and training, human services personnel slash professional helpers in substance use treatment, trauma and mental health, crisis intervention, poverty as related to public health model, then finally conclusion recommendations and it's through in my references that I use. Now it's a mouthful I have to tell you, but I'll do my best to make sure that we grasp as much as we can from my presentation. So my introduction really speaks to the impact of substance use disorder that spans communities throughout Guyana. And this presentation is a call to raise awareness for the need of a national treatment facility for citizens who are facing challenges of substance use disorders. I don't think I need to repeat it, but I'll repeat it. It's really a call to raise awareness for the need of a national treatment facility for citizens who are facing challenges of substance use disorders in Guyana. The other part is that I will focus on Georgetown, although this information is transferable to other areas, bearing in mind Guyana's 10 regions and availability of substances like alcohol, you know, is culturally accepted, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on, and other mood-altering chemicals. Now, let's talk a bit about the effects of the pandemic on mental health and substance use. In the world at large, I think we all know this, and on various levels, the experience of the pandemic has definitely interfered with our lives and lifestyles. Many have had to find ways of coping. Some of those ways were healthy ways. Some of those ways were unhealthy ways. Some healthy ways of coping include becoming conscious of and instituting nutritional eating habits, engaging in exercise programs as best as we could have at home, and following protocols of COVID-19. On the other hand, some unhealthy coping ways include the way, and I say include because in some ways we're still going through the pandemic. Some of those unhealthy ways include the display of anger management, engagement in domestic violent behavior, the use of substances that began for first timers, and the increase of substance use for those who've already indulged in substance use behavior whether they have stopped prior to the pandemic 
or continued using during the pandemic and even after. Mind you, I put after in quotes, right? Because some people feel that the pandemic is behind us. Newsflash, we're still in the pandemic, reality check. So the Guyanese society has a lot to, uh, has not been spared rather. We have not been spared of all of these ills and the effects of the pandemic. Culturally, I want to speak to the mental health piece here. Culturally, we know that Guyanese do not readily embrace counseling or mental health intervention. And there are a few reasons why this is so. One of them is fear of being called crazy. We know that we throw around that crazy word like there is no tomorrow. Like there's no, it's nobody's business. More importantly, the issue of trust is frontal. As many individuals who consider treatment hesitate to seek treatment because they're concerned that their personal business is not private with a social worker or interventionist. Trust is a big issue for us. What that means, that means that many who can benefit from treatment do not seek it. Hence, there's the critical issue of confidentiality. Secrecy is also another element that guides our warrior, especially when it comes to mental illness and addiction. Those are two heavy hitters there. So when someone is dealing with mental illness or substance use disorder, this individual is most times left to deal with the situation on their own. Why? Family members tend to discard or ignore them, mainly because of shame or a lack of knowledge about mental illness and addiction. It should be recognized that there is no single cause of addiction and addiction does not discriminate. And I would like to say the same thing for mental health. Now, when we look further at how substance use disorder plays into it, we also have to look at the rise in incidents like domestic violence, intimate partner violence, homicide, suicide, <laughs> burglary, vandalism, prostitution, and other criminal activities and self-destructive behaviors. And there are many that we can list. One of the models that I subscribe to as a substance use disorder practitioner is the disease model of addiction. According to my colleagues Van Warmer and Davis, family illness refers to the malfunctioning of the addicted family. And I want to spend a couple of quick minutes on this. The reason why I want to do this is because I want to highlight that when we talk addiction, we're talking a family disease. So say for example, Dr. Denton is the person using in our family. This is our family. And let's say that she is the mother and she's using, whether it's alcohol or drugs, guess what? Her daughter, would have to pick up some of her slack because her functioning as the mother is affected negatively. What that does though in the family is really shifts the responsibility and the roles of the other family members. Hence the disease concept or the disease model is most applicable when I practice in the field. So it doesn't matter whether the family is a single family, 
a single parent family or a double parented family. It doesn't matter. And I would also stretch this out to the workplace because think of working with a colleague who has a problem with substance use. That person is not coming to work on time or they're not coming to work. And when they do, when they do, even though they show up, they might not be able to perform at their best. And when they don't, somebody else has to pick up the job. So it's a similar application of the model in terms of roles being changed, even in the work environment. So as previously mentioned, members of the household are at risk when substance use is involved due to the family disease concept of addiction. Unfortunately, a household dealing with a fallout from the pandemic also faced illnesses including inclusive of mental and physical in nature, addiction, along with other issues like unemployment, housing, displacement, I should say housing displacement, some people have become homeless because of it, right? And even death. Many family members who lived in discord were forced. They were forced to spend time together in the same space at the same time. And I'm sure that some of you know some of this. And what, what, that, what that effect was, domestic violence increased. Because prior to the pandemic, it was easy for somebody to coordinate, okay, she's home now, I don't have to be home. Or he's home now, I don't have to be home. But with the pandemic and the lockdown, individuals, families were forced to be in the same space at the same time. And children were exposed to behaviors such as domestic violence and substance use. So this meant that family and other members were not spared the different forms of abuse. Parents' inability to provide for their children to learn remotely did not help this already tenuous situation. So what I'm getting at here is the piece with delinquency, how the trauma of substance use and, and mental health affected delinquency. For some families, go back one step forward. For some families, the inability to cope resulted in children even being abandoned. Dropping out of school became accepted. It was noted that after the restrictions of the pandemic were lifted and students were expected to return to school, a significant number of them did not return here in Guyana. The Ministry of Education had put an outreach program in place to alert caregivers about the importance of reconnecting students with their schools. But guess what? It didn't happen 100%. I don't want to mis miscall it, um, Dr. Hudson, but I think he might have said 40% answered the call. I might be a little off there, but he did call, and I can't remember. Now, due to this, it, is, it can be inferred that delinquency is on the rise and the future of these students as adults may be severely impacted if other forms of uh, interventions are not timely done. We're talking about our future here, folks. One of my colleagues highlighted that underachievement in academics has long-lasting negative consequences for the student, family, and society at large. In other words, students' involvement in delinquent behavior also has to have the potential to push them on the road to other deviant behaviors, such as being on the drug scene as a helper for the drug dealer and even user, given the readily available drugs on the street. So we're talking now about a different vocation that individual, that youth, is going to be thinking of. 
and I come to education and training. And if I sound passionate about this, it's because I am. Because education is key. It is important that the government considers how society is educated about substance use disorders. And I'll repeat that. It is important that the government of Guyana considers how society is educated about substance use disorders. It is noteworthy that culturally, the use of alcohol and nicotine as in cigarettes is an accepted way of socializing in Guyana. The legality of these substances are unhelpful and contribute to the ready availability and likely abuse of these substances that are detrimental to one's health. Notwithstanding the fact that nicotine, as in cigarette smoking, is a highly toxic stimulant that targets the central nervous system. Now, many guys may not see the importance of drug education. Knowing these substances are legal, for example, alcohol and cigarettes, especially nicotine, which is the substance in cigarettes. The use of alcohol and nicotine is usually a part of most gatherings, right? We know that, birth, christenings, deaths, wakes, and oftentimes children are in the middle of, they're part of these gatherings. Thus exposing them to substance use behavior that they eventually model. I don't know if it's happening now, but as a child, I know that parents used to send their children to the shop to buy alcohol. It's still happening. It's worse now. And there is no regulation there on who gets to buy alcohol. So in that sense, we can see how that behavior is accepted by our culture. And I say I, our culture because I'm proud Guyanese. So for some, this becomes problematic for them later as adults. And this brings into focus the social learning theory aspect of what we're talking about. And social uh, learning theory really bridges teaching and learning behaviors. And I want to throw in the use of substances as one of those behaviors. Elements of social learning theory look at the opportunities that make it easy for children to imitate behaviors to which they are exposed. So we just talked about, I just made mention of the scenarios of weights and prisons, right? And their children there. And everybody's drinking or most people are drinking and the children are there. So they're seeing it and it's accepted and it's no big deal. So they're learning that this is okay. <laughs> As a preventive, uh, as a preventive model um, comes to mind, I would say that it's prudent for the Ministry of Education to consider the implementation of classes in the school system, both primary and secondary school, and implement classes that address substance use disorder. Directly, we're not talking about skidding around it and calling it something else. Let's call it what it is because of what we are dealing with in our society today. This can be done under the guide of, for example, the health sciences department. Generally speaking, in biology courses, the anatomy and organs functions are already being addressed. So why not add some modules to the coursework and focus could be um, the effects of, say, for example, alcohol on one's health. The embrace of the preventive model will enable children, the youth, to gain knowledge and understanding at an early age about the effects of substances. That's really what I'm saying. Another consideration could be the implementation of school prevention programs. One that has been tried and proven around the world is drug abuse resistance education there. It's recommended for children uh, grades five through six, specifically, but the US Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs 
they have done uh, research with this program and validated that it works from kindergarten through 12th grade. And they have used this in over 54 countries. They've taught 36 million students each year using this. And it is 80% in the school districts in the, in, in the, um, around the world, uh, in the United States, sorry. Now, the goal of the curriculum is to equip elementary, middle, and high school students with the knowledge and skills to resist substance abuse, violence, and gangs. Now, a preventive model such as there is likely to be a deterrent for students who are considering the use of substances, ultimately, in instilling, instituting there in the school system. Likewise, it would be helpful for the University of Guyana to have a specialized track in substance use to support the void of social workers who would like to work with the substance using population. I could tell you that's not happening. Mm -hmm. And I could tell you why it's not happening. In having conversations with Guyanese substance use disorder counselors, it was revealed that there are not too many graduates from UG who enter this arena. I'm telling you, I did some research because I didn't want to come and talk off the fly. And if you check, you'll see the recency of the conversations that I have. Staff of Phoenix Recovery Project would periodically visit UG and talk with students about their interest in joining the workforce dealing with addiction to determine suitability for working with this population. Now, Phoenix Recovery Project is one of the two major treatment facilities. The other one is Salvage at the Salvation Army. One of the things that I found out in talking with folks of Phoenix Recovery Project is that there is no particular guideline for selecting a student. Here how it happens. We go into UG and we talk to students of the social work, the social work program, and I guess the sociology program about the work that we do at Phoenix Recovery, at Phoenix Recovery Project. You can go back to the next slide before. And in talking to students to find out where they are, how they're thinking, if they use words such as junkie, crackhead, and drunkie, and drunkie, that's it. You don't have a shot of getting to intern. And I'm using the word intern very loosely. You don't get a shot to intern at uh, a Phoenix Recovery Project. On, on the other hand, once the student is selected, that student is able to get an internship for two or three months. So that would be, the selection would be of students who didn't use the words such as junkie, crackhead, and the other derogatory terms. So currently, UG social work curriculum comprises 30 courses, and dig this, with only one four credit course. And when I said that I have the information, this is what I mean. And I want to take pause here and say kudos to UG for the work that they're doing, the social work department, because I know that the faculty works hard. Faculty needs support. That's my cry here, right? One four credit course, and the name of that course is Social Work and Addictions. That's it. I'm thinking that you've gone to UG? Yeah, okay. So given the current public health issue of substance use, UG would need to consider a more robust social work curriculum that directly involves courses in and related to substance use disorders. To me, it makes sense. It is critical that UG students understand that substance use disorders are not only connected to behavioral health, but also to mental health, human behavior, and social environment. Think about how we move around all day. We cannot exclude any of those concepts, any of those realities. 
It would also be beneficial for the sociology curriculum to include some courses in addiction. And I say that because I checked and there was none. In looking at how adults learners learn, it should not be left to chance that the learning experience occurs in a vacuum, whether that vacuum is in the classroom, personal experience or personal desire. Embedded in courses should be screening tools for alcohol and other substances. And I just mentioned the one cage, which really is important and can be used. You can go to the next slide. I mentioned that the exposure to diagnosing through the use of the International Classification of Diseases, ICD from the World Health Organization, would also help students to learn about effective diagnosing in the classroom, not waiting until you get to the field and you're learning about this. It should happen in the classroom. So being exposed to different theories and therapies yes. are effective in dealing with substance use disorders. For example, motivational interviewing, which is a collaboration uh, between the counselor and the client about how the client's strengths can be used to motivate him or her to, com to commit to change. Another is client-centered or a strength-based approach where the practitioner assesses and focuses on the client's strength in a supporting way of the client's recovery. Just as important, there needs to be continuing education and training for us, the personnel, to address the needs of individuals who present with issues related to substance use. These personnel should include and are not limited to administrators of social services and the educational system. Social workers, case workers, child protection services staff, teachers, law enforcement personnel, police and probation officers, lawyers, psychiatrists, psychologists, and judges. And like I said, this is a limited list. The relevance of education and trainings lends for effective treatment successful outcomes, reduction in recidivism, better rehabilitation, less stigmatization and labeling of individuals who struggle with substance use disorder. And you all know what I'm talking about. It's easy to leave, label somebody. It's easy to stigmatize somebody because they're using substances or and or because they're dealing with mental illness. Now I wanna turn our attention to human services personnel and professional health person substance use uh, treatment. So there is limited numbers of educated and trained personnel who address substance use disorders in Guyana. And I got this from someone who works in the field. Some reasons given by individuals who, em who embrace or would like to embrace the professional health field are, and this is from my personal experience as a uh, as a professor, I like to help others. That's what you hear. I was told I give good advice. I am a good listener. I have a lot of experience with that, whatever the that is, whatever the situation is on that. And what I'm saying is, although these are re these reasons might be well intentioned, they are just not enough, solid enough. It's not a salary requirement for being a professional helper that points to the importance really of education and training. There is a place for experience, yes, but experience without education and training could be detrimental to the person that we're helping. For someone to be successful in the helping profession, there needs to be some form of practical on-hand training internship attached to the educational component. And when I say that, they are walking lockstep. So I am in the classroom and guess what? Right next to me is the internship experience. So that what I'm learning in the classroom can be applied to the field. And what I'm learning in the field, I can bring back to the classroom and say, oh miss, that's not what they're doing in the agency that I am doing my internship. And then guess what? It might be totally unethical, whatever the agency is doing now, it stands to reason that whoever misses, whoever that teacher is, that professor is, 
talks to that agency because you want to make sure that students are learning ethical ways of doing the business. As previously noted, there's lack of uniformity regarding how an individual gets into the field, right? Because if you come to my agent, if, if you come to UG and I'm a student there and I use junkie, crackhead, that's it. My desire to make a difference in the lives of others, that's shelved because I don't know that I should not be saying these words, these derogatory words, because it's around me. How am I going to get the experience to learn that these are derogatory words that you should not be using as a professional? Oh. The few counselors in the field work in more than one agency at the same time as, as a way of addressing the lack of qualified personnel. So the few who are qualified, and I'm using that word very sparingly, they work at more than one agency. They go between the two that I mentioned. So UG has informal practical agreements, and most of these agreements are with agencies that do not address substance use disorder. Obviously, right, because there is only one um, one course in that. And UG, I was told that UG will be working on reformalizing the agreements that were disrupted due to COVID-19. So let's look at let's look quickly at law enforcement and social justice. So like professional helpers, it is relevant that Guyanese law enforcement personnel are educated and trained in substance use disorder. A very critical reason being that individuals who use substances tend to have multiple encounters with law enforcement personnel. Substance use is also a behavioral issue, which means that substance users engage in many unlawful and risky behaviors, inclusive but not limited to stealing, vandalism, acts of violence, self-inflicted injuries, suicidal attempts, and drug sales. Think about that. All of those behaviors are heavy hitters that could affect not just the person's life, but the public. I'm still, I'm still in my mind's eye thinking about the whole public health model, which I'll talk to in a minute. So the void of education and training for law enforcement personnel, potentially the, the void, potentially leads to the jails and the prisons being overloaded with individuals who are really ill and need to be in rehab treatment due to their substance using behavior. And not so much because of the visible result of incarceration. So take pause for a little bit and think of individuals who you might know who have been stricken with substance use disorders and might be in prison right now when rehab would be the better place for them to be. But then we'll have a problem with rehab, which we'll talk about also in a minute. So although it is evident that the penal system also has a role in this, it was noted that aside from the drug court, there are no trainings for law enforcement personnel who interact with individuals who use substances. And I want to um, talk about drug court in a minute, because what I also found out was that there's one psychiatrist who works at the drug court and the referral is made to him and he decides what happens uh, to that person who comes before him. And then uh, um, a decision is sent to the judge and the judge rules on that when there's someone who's using substances fully before the penal system and before the psychiatrist. So it should be noted that there are two criminal justice related courses that are offered at UG in talking about um, the whole piece with law enforcement now. Criminology and criminal criminology and the criminal justice system. That's two different courses. Oh, I'm sorry, criminology and the criminal justice system. And the other one is the sociology of punishment and corrections. Those two I saw. And I don't think I missed any. Now, due to the lack of training and the unaffordability, unavailability, and or inaccessibility of substance use treatment, it is noticeable how substance use treatment could be a moot point for law enforcement and the social justice system. Wouldn't you agree? Right? If there aren't any 
trainings for them. It would be business as usual. So in other words, somebody who uses substance will indeed and indulge in criminal behavior will be treated as a criminal first and not someone who is ill, who needs treatment. So trauma and mental health, it could stem from childhood, adult, negative, life-changing experiences. And although substance use does not happen in the vacuum, the Guyanese culture tends to stigmatize and discriminate against those individuals um, who's trouble with substance use disorder. Next slide, please. And I talked already about the stigmatization and the drugs and labels. I added a couple more here, like Puckhead, Alki, and Saji. I don't know if they use that anymore. Saji, I'm dating myself. And the word addict and alcoholic are at times used with seemingly partial, if any, understanding of what the words truly mean. And due to the impact of substance use on loved ones, misunderstanding and ignorance of the subject matter, many individuals who struggle with substance use are literally put out in the homes. Now, this brings me to highlight homelessness as a result of substance use. They are called, the individuals who are in the street, they're called crazy. They are uh, taken for granted, they're exploited against. They can be found in the markets of Borda and Stavro for cheap labor. And again, they're on the streets and intervention is not being offered because there is none. The next slide. The point that I wanna make is that aside from, I, I talk about poverty, if you can go to the poverty slide. Um, I talked about poverty in this presentation because uh, many individuals sell drugs also to make money. And those are individuals who are quite vulnerable, who may not have a trade, who might have not gone to school early, and there's nobody to assist them along the way. So unemployment, lack of trade, education deficits are some of those issues that would face someone who is engaging in uh, substance use and who might also be dealing with the issue of poverty. The public health model comes to mind. We have to embrace the public health model because when we see a homeless individual on the street or someone stricken by substance use disorder, it becomes a public health model because that person is within our sphere. I cannot not talk about migration. And one of the things that I would like to emphasize here as I'm about to bring this to a close with migration is that people tend to bring their behaviors with them. So when migrants or immigrants come to a different country, they bring those behaviors with them. Guyana is no exception. So if you have, if we have individuals who come from other countries who've been using substances, guess what they'll use here. If they've been dealing substances, they've been they're going to deal here. Also, we know that Guyana has been up there in terms of in the world as a place of transit for drugs. It seeps into our country through our porous borders. Continue. So, I want to conclude here and say that Guyana has a lot of work to be done. This presentation was done to raise awareness of the need for a national treatment facility for citizens who are facing challenges of substance use disorders. The address topics were the effects of the pandemic on mental health and substance use, the related trauma of substance use and its consequences on delinquency, education and training, human service personnel, professional helpers in substance use treatment, law enforcement and social justice, trauma and mental health, crisis intervention, poverty is related to the public health model, migration, and I wanna make some recommendations. The Guyana government must consider the social and economic impact on substance use disorders in this country. And I mean that in every way because we have two treatment facilities, the Salvation Army that charges, 300 US a month 
for at least six months. And Phoenix Recovery Project that charges $350 a month for at least six months of treatment. So right there, there's some exclusivity that's happening because the individuals who really need the treatment cannot afford it. Uh, the Ministry of Education's consideration for the inclusion of drug education in the school system, such as there, there should be a hard launch of the implementation of this in the educational system. In other words, big it up, like you big up a lot of other things when it's launched. Enhance the UG curriculum to develop and include substance use disorder, uh, disorder related courses. Effective substance use education for social workers, caseworkers, child prevention services staff, teachers, law enforcement personnel, police and probation officers, lawyers, psychiatrists, psychologists, and to some extent judges that lead to certification in substance use disorder treatment. I'm taking it up a little notch because we're talking about. The, the importance of becoming specialized on the track of substance use disorders. I'm also recommended that there are artistic and cultural activities for youth that would be instrumental for preventive measures, resilience, and self-care to deter them from looking at substance use. Most importantly, there should be consideration for a national substance use disorder treatment facility. These are my references, and you can just go through them quickly. And I just wanted to say thank you as we put up the smiley faces at the end and say, you have been great. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. October, for that informed and uh, eloquent presentation. Thank you. We're going to hold questions until after the next presenters speak. Please don't forget your questions. Please write um, down because uh, we're careful to manage the time and we are um, we really are graced with the wonderful presence of Dr. Sharma. Dr. Sharma is a managing director of RAHAT Charitable and Medical Research Trust in India. Dr. Sharma has a master's in philosophy and a PhD in clinical psychology and is a practicing clinical psychologist. Right. He's a practicing clinical psychologist for about 35 years. Dr. Sharma um, manages the trustee of RAHAT, Charitable and Medical Research Trust, an NGO. Dr. Sharma is also a consultant psychiatrist at the Woodland Hospital, thank you, at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Georgetown here in Guyana, a professor of behavioral science at the American University here in Georgetown, Diana. Dr. Sharma was professor and chair of the behavioral sciences and consultant to Ross University School of Medicine. Prior to returning to Guyana in 2019, he was a psychiatrist at Ross University Counseling and Health Service. He has also served as a consultant to the Pan-American Health Organization, PAPO, developing mental health plans for several Caribbean countries and providing training in disaster management in the Caribbean, Central, and South America. He is committed to public education in Guyana for improving knowledge about mental health and promoting wellness. That's a resume. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Sharpie. Yes. Thank you very much. And, um, good day to everyone, and <clears throat> hope you're hearing me good. You know, please. And want to acknowledge the very good people here in the crowd and also in the view one of our medical students at Texila. We have DJ Stress from the radio and uh, Dr. October, I truly enjoy your presentation. Dr. Henry here, psychiatrist. So you, I need you here because that's, that's the support we need to get uh, the change of antiquated, ambiguous terminology happens. And we're talking about terms that we commonly accept and recognize as part of diagnosis. We've been using these terms for a long time. And these terms are going back into the previous century. And because this should be loading a little 
Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so, there we go. <laughs> so, I gather to make the mouse work, you shake it. <laughs> so, here's the point. Um, we want this to be the goal, and this is not my goal, it's the goal I actually found that quite a number of other psychiatrists and persons who feel that we've been self-discriminated, that the system itself was actually almost self-abusing by allowing these terminologies and these classification systems to continue. And I think the time is now here to change. And I know that we in Ghana we talk about change. It was uh, the Obama movement for change, and I hope we can feel it here now that we'll make a change to this troubling problem, which has troubled me for quite a long time, even when I was in medical school. And then I entered the University of West Indies to do my doctorate. I was not very happy about the way the classification system worked. And I thought that was on my own, but then I found quite a number of other people, even in the American Psychiatric Association on the executive committee, I have friends here who believe that what I'm saying makes sense. So that's the goal of today's presentation. I'll go through very quickly. I think we can just focus on these objectives, very simple, look at the definition of what health is, look a little bit at the historical perspectives and um try to find a way forward that I hope all of us are in re agreement that would make a difference for not me, not my cause. The cause is really the patients. And they're the ones that are most hurt by the things we do as practitioners, as physicians. And I know Dr. October touched on it a number of times, the word stigma. Uh, if we look at the, the definition by the, the word health of Good health, which everybody knows, and it's something that uh, goes back in time also to a state of complete physical, mental. And as you see, I put the word mental in red because it actually takes mental away from physical. I don't want to let you know right up front that I truly believe that mental and physical are the same. There is no mental because when we ask medical students, doctors, even in who are qualified, what we understand by the word mental, very big definitions that you get. If you ask uh, anybody what they understand by the word cardiology, they will tell you quite quickly it's the heart, but you can't get one straight definition of these terms. I think that makes the point I'm making. If I had to put a questionnaire to people here in this room and ask you, would you understand by the word schizophrenia, we're going to get very different opinions from everybody. And the best I've heard from my medical students when I ask them that is that they say it's a break from reality, but that's not the word. What does the word mean? It actually means a splitting of the mind. It already makes very little sense. If you're talking to young people in the room, when you have somebody who works in the frame, they're very often they're pitching somebody who has a serious mental condition, and it creates a very negative image. So Get, um, the more de more recent definitions with power, I see the addition of neurobiological substance abuse and uh, added to the definition, but the word still is kept. The Department of Health and Human Services in the USA has now uh, actually put a very good definition of mental health, emotional, social, psychological well-being, but I still have a problem with the word psychological. In terms of the word psychiatry, when we look at textbooks of training, they actually have a section for the review system that they part of the history taken, where you put the body systems and ask questions about general health and central nervous system and so on. The, the Bates textbook put a section called psychiatry. Uh, all the other body systems are physiological, but this one stands on its own and it actually is exploring emotion. So it's almost like a separate system. However, the other very, very popular book by Schwartz has psychiatry actually under neurology. 
the true data makes a lot of sense. And that's the point I want to make very early that psychiatry, all the symptoms, all the disorders are coming from one place person's brain, it's not coming from some supernatural source, it's in our brains. And we can remove all the psychological problems by taking out people's parts of their brains and deal with those different areas. Then we have things like the mental health world is also confused. So people confuse mental health and mental illness. And this study by uh, in the McLean program shows that they often use interchangeably when we talk about mental illness and mental health. People don't seem to know the difference. And I actually had a study done uh, with uh, Dr. Liva from Pahu in Dominica in 2000, where we look at the attitudes of persons in Dominica to mental illnesses and generally the attitude of the public is negative. They believe most mental illnesses fall into what we know, a very small spectrum of psychotic illnesses, which just make up about a 1% of all illnesses. When you're talking about classification of mental disorders, you're talking about over 400 disorders, but most people will tend to name only about four or five, depression, anxiety, and schizophrenia, psychosis. So there's a lot of non-knowledge non out there, a lot of misunderstanding. Here's a study in the UK which showed that up to 61% of the person didn't have a true understanding of the terms. And that was in 2015. And a lot of other studies after that, as recent as 2022, which supports the same finding, generally about 70% of people in the population not understanding terms. Health literacy is a word. Um, we're talking about mental health literacy. And what are the effects when the health literacy is poor? Mental health stigma or stigma to mental health disorders are very high. And nobody will question that. Uh, Dr. October, you mentioned how people often look at these individuals and call them names. Uh, and that makes people shy away from seeking help. Even people who may suffer severe depression and uh, I've been suicidal thinking may now reach out for help because they want to, they don't want to be labeled. They don't want to have that stigma attached to them and they don't want to suffer. So there are a lot of negative consequences to, to revealing that you have a mental condition. Um, of course, the attitudes, as I said, in the society are very negative. Most people regard people with severe mental health disorders as dangerous, and that's absolutely, absolutely untrue. Even for the persons who are affected by these disorders, they feel a great sense of embarrassment, shame, and the suicide rate associated with psychosis and severe depressions are very, very high. You're talking about, talking about 15 percent of persons with those. So today, I wanted to review a lot of the literature out there that supports my my thinking. And hopefully that we can all come on board because together, united, we can make that change. So here we have a lot of studies that have been done. So it's not me in isolation. There are people that are recognizing this as a problem. And here's a beautiful study done, published in the Neuropsychiatry Journal that talks about stereotyping, um, the way people view individuals, the way people are stigmatized, the way cultural practices operate, stigmatize people. Many cultures see people with mental health problems are demon possessed or evil minded. And actually, I did a presentation here so many years ago on, on the study I did on, uh, on my nurses and the psychiatric unit. And it was quite remarkable that they, the majority of them, felt the patients had uh, evil involved in their illnesses. And they were the nurses on the unit, quite remarkable. Um, so the, the consequences are there, even in the past, and still in many countries, even here, I think in Guyana, we have some, some practices that are discriminatory against persons with mental health problems. Um, insurances in the past would not take mental health diagnosis. That stopped in the States through the act of 2017, just five years ago. We haven't reached that yet. I don't think we have an act, or it's in the process. I want to commend the minister and please keep up the good work. We're going to make those changes in the laws because 
We cannot accept people abusing our patients. So here's another big area that's happening that people with these disorders are neglected. And if you see even the way the attitudes of our doctors and primary care often not really wanted to manage these patients, I'm wondering which medical school they came from, what, what training did they have? They should have the confidence of managing all disorders. Generally, again, it's a, it's a stigma attached to even people who provide the care. So people are treated differently or not treated at all. We actually looked at how people are treated in primary care in Guyana. Uh, many of our persons with mental health problems have to be treated by the psychiatrists when they go into the clinics, especially, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the doctors should be able, and family physicians in the US often do very, very good psychiatric care management. And that should be the same thing for our doctors here again. So there's clearly a stigma attached to even the personnel who try to provide treatment. So, um, and so look at the, the problem, we, we know that this is very significant. The, the World Health said that the next pandemic after COVID would be the mental health problems of the world. And they're right, one and a half of persons um, uh, don't get help. So what are we doing about this pandemic? Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on COVID. It's like the whole world jumped when COVID came. So nobody is jumping in the same way about this new pandemic. If they are correct, they are, they said it, it's not me saying it. So we have serious evidence that shows our persons are discriminated about losing their jobs. Um, I was lecturing to my students and I, I told them, you know, I gave them stories and I told them about a patient I had in, uh, in Jamaica who was a physician with bipolar disorder. She's pretty well known in public knowledge. But I won't give names, but they, they many of them said, why would a doctor be allowed to become a why would men should be allowed to become a doctor or should be being practiced if they have a bipolar disorder? They are obviously going to be very dangerous to people. So they really don't get it that this is a condition. We don't do that to people with diabetes, and they can go into a coma and still be dangerous. It can be a pilot with diabetes and contract way they think they'll manage. So it's all about managing. So here I want to make the point that we have the elephant in the room, but we don't see it, you know? It, it's there. So that elephant is the terminology. That's what we use it. We have this going on for too long. That, that terminology is that elephant in the room. People don't see it because, you know, we, we don't discuss that issue. It, it's kind of like controversial. Well, why is it controversial up to now? Somebody has attempted. It's very clear that you got research that shows that these terms are seen as offensive, both to other people and to the patients themselves. So numbers are there, references are there. There's a study done, um, published in Hoopa, which is a big program in the United Kingdom for supporting persons with mental health problems. So we do know that names are negative to people. If you give, as I say, give a dog a bad name, what do you expect will happen, you know? The word psychotherapist, uh, somebody uh, is, you know, I don't know if you, you recognize that this word has a very negative connotation. Uh, if you break it up, psycho, the, you know, so that's really horrible when you think about it. Um, and somebody actually put this on the, a person with a psychotherapist, they put it below the door in the name plate. I was very demeaning and traumatizing to that person. So they took out their name of psychotherapist and changed it to counselor. And psychotherapy is very powerful therapy. It's very wonderful, but people make fun of these individuals. You know, it can affect job opportunities. Um, as I said, give the dog a bad name and you hang them for that. Here we have, if you name somebody Satan, what do you expect to happen? So Satan was in was somebody named uh, for this guy, and he actually was sentenced for um, robbery. So just an example of naming people and names. Um, you know, my, my daughter in Brooklyn, she told me that, you know, that's a very true point you're making because 
I know that some students will change their name because they, if they, they fail to give them a their early name in Dubai and they get teased a lot, so they, they want it to be changed. Or sometimes you go for a job because of the name, the person, I don't want to call the name, but you know, get a bit fearful that this individual could be belonging to some kind of gang because those names are very common to gang, gang groups. So let's go back to the term to use in psychiatry. It's very hard to define. Um, often people are just you go to the words like the, the all about madness and craziness and dismissive terms, you know. The word psychology, the study of the psyche, what is the psyche? The mind, when you ask people to define the mind, they can't. The mind is actually very clearly a function of our frontal brain. It says no, 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 brain, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no, you don't need to exercise the brain too much to, to, to know where the mind is. It's in our brains. It's not, it's not uh, much brain work that we need to do there. Um, so if you, as I said, you get terms like schizophrenia, you'll get a hundred different opinions. Uh, nobody comes up with a true term, which is a neurobiological and a genetic disorder that changes people neurochemical function. I mean, it's a very broad term, but that's what it is. It's a genetic disorder. That's unfortunate. It's young people that develop this condition, and we're already starting with a word that is stigmatizing them. Uh, how do you tell them? Um, you tell a parent, your, your child now has, I'm sorry to tell you, but they have schizophrenia. How do you think they're, they're like that? So we saw that changing terms make a difference. That happened when the change term mental retardation. So here's the point that I'm making that PET scans are showing exactly where these problems are. It's in the brain. And we're gonna make ourselves in the laughing stock to the Department of Nuclear Biology and um, Health Imaging Study, which can show us like, what are you guys talking about? You already know for many, many years that these conditions are genetically related. They're caused by brain dysfunction, they're caused by uh, Genetics, they're caused by neurochemical changes. What is so hard for us in psychiatry to accept that? We've seen it, the PET scan is showing us. They're getting more advanced from the PET scan. We're finding the genes now that are causing these things. In the old days, we knew Alzheimer's was linked to maybe one gene, the same one that caused Down syndrome. Now we know all the genes that are causing the amyloid protein to deposit in the brain. What is so difficult? So they have to change it from senile dementia to Alzheimer's dementia, you know, much more appropriate term than using the very antiquated and uh, uh, humanizing uh, terms, stigmatizing terms. So here we have this PET scan study showing that the dopamine is affected, D2E area is affected. There are many, many studies that people can go and look at. It's not me, it's there, the evidence is there, PET scans. Um, and here they're talking in this study, this was done in 2010, way back in 2010, that they are recommending further imaging so that we can understand pathophysiology of these disorders, not the psychopathophysiology. They're saying the pathophysiology, take away that type of word. So here, going back to schizophrenia, because I want to emphasize that quite quickly, is that there are studies that are showing that taking away the word schizophrenia, changing it will change negative attitude. It's been shown. Here's a study that showed that when you use health promotion and health education, using those old terms, they didn't work very well. People didn't respond to it very well. And this is a beautiful study done on 241 medical students in a Cambridge study. And it actually showed that um, medical students, when they are divided into two groups, the one that were dealing with the term schizophrenia had a much more negative attitude to the group that were given in newer modern neurobiological terms. So we're, we're seeing the evidence. Um, here, here are the results from that study. Um, so they, they recommended from that study uh, that there should be alternative terminology to destigmatize this term this medical word, schizophrenia. Uh, this is an amazing study. This is, a, a, I know there's an officer at the conference. I, I actually teach him that one if this is his study. Um, 
And let me thank this on maybe his study where the diagnosis using this is very powerful. Uh, this is the point he's making the diagnosis using psychiatry heavily loaded with stigma and changing the name psychiatry, uh, schizophrenia or psychiatry is an opportunity for change. So we got people doing it, uh, application is there. So well, what are we seeing as evidence for this? Did anybody do it? Yes. The Asian countries beat us to it. I thought Ghana should be the leaders for change, but here, the, the Japanese, they come up with a, a new word from the schizophrenia, which is you see in that, that right in there, mind split disease, the total nonsense, to a condition they call the integration disorder. That's not my favorite, sorry, Japan. <laughs> The one by Singapore and Taiwan, I love that. Hong Kong also, they produce really good stuff. So let me quickly run through those slides. So this is the one, um, but they show that change, they studied it, that change in the words in the premium made it big difference. Look at the number jumping from 36%, 70% of people who had a positive view of those conditions, right? after the change, and that's in Japan. And they use a word like integration disorder, which is still not very clear. What do you mean by integration? Integrated things in the brain. But they also found that um, in the 6% of the psychiatrists, uh, of one, uh, the 136 psychiatrists, they're lucky to have so many, <laughs> that they, um, they also had a positive view of the change of the terminology. So, so here's the conclusion of that, that um, the persons also who were affected, they felt very positive about the change. They actually were involved in spreading the good word, so to speak, a change has come. Korea, they also changed it to a new term. So these are, they, they, um, they felt that people are confusing it with this also dissociative identity disorder. So they, they changed it to an attunement disorder. And then Hong Kong, they change it to a better term, which is uh, the one that I said I like, which is more in terms of the neurobiological change. And that's the case about dysfunction of thought and perception. So basically, these countries like uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, moved to the disorder of thinking. And if we go back in time to Emil Fraplin, who talked about dementia pre, pre he way back in time was considering this to be a cognitive disorder. And it is, it is a disorder of the frontal lobe. Remember the one flu of the cuckoo's nest when the person was so psychotic, they did a frontal lobotomy and all he became a passive person. So we can actually cure the condition by just taking out people's frontal lobe. But that's not the way. So here we have um, a push by Taiwan to actually go for a physical change in their text, in their books, uh, what they call the system of classification. And they moved to a new term, which is basically the change in a, uh, cognitive uh, function. Um, they did a lot of educational work. I think they took about five years to promote this change. So it's a serious thing. It doesn't happen overnight. The DSM-5 people are not going to change it because I say so. I think they'll change it if Columbia University put pressure. <laughs> Oh, and the universe again, so let me forget our well, unsexual university. So we got we got uh, work to do. So they would propose some new terms, and I, I actually will tell you the new term in a, a, a moment at uh, the end of the presentation, which is very soon. Um, just to run through uh, a few slides in terms of the history, uh, these terms were changed, neurosis was changed. Um, why was it changed? They felt that it, it didn't make sense. Uh, that was the DSM, uh, the American Psychiatric Association, changing that word neurosis. Remember that that word carried a lot of negative connotations. People are called neurotic when they were anxious. You know, it's not a good thing to do that. If nobody likes to be called these words when they're okay, much less the patient. If we won't do it to ourselves. How many of us probably say I'm a neurotic person? You know? So it was removed in the DSM in the 80s. But we still carry those terms. I must say the, the leaders for the change of the word mental retardation was the association of Americans with their mental retardation. And they actually changed the name of their association from mental retardation to the intellectual disability disorder. 
So they, they led by example. So they actually changed the whole name of their organization and they push, they push hard for the change of mental retardation. But long before the American Psychiatric Associations did, you know, finally they did it in the DSM-5 calling it your developmental deal. So change will happen. We got to convince these people that it should happen. So hopefully these kind of things will get to them and they will see us making that change. We got to do it here, even if it's not in the DSM-5, I believe we have to start thinking that we could make those changes for our people. So attitudes in the name, again, we go back to um, the problems linked to names. Mental retardation is a classical example. And President Obama, he himself signed into law, the rules of law that made it discriminatory practice for calling people the word mental retardation. Good thing. But not only that, they also made discrimination practices across the board. You can't discriminate against people for health insurance. I got it. Maybe that's not the case for us in Guyana. So we got to work to do here. We got to make it happen. If Obama could make the change, we will have to make it happen. So that was a slide on the DSM 5. And I don't know if we go back. Okay. I just want to show what the DSM 5 uses. Uh, and that's most law. So we go forward. Uh, right. Yeah. So, um, these are the terms that um, the DSM-5 actually uses to make the diagnosis of schizophrenia. This diagnosis of schizophrenia is dropped the subtype, but they have the these symptoms or signs. And look at these symptoms and signs. Go to the next one. So what, what is the nature of these signs? Delusion, hallucination, disorganized thinking, disorganized movement, and negative symptoms. What are the nature of those things? If you think about it, they all are identified by brain function. They are brain function. There's nothing ambiguous about them. A delusion is a thought disorder. It's a thought problem. Your thinking has gone to a delusional state, which means your belief system has gone out of control. Can happen to anybody. You know, drugs, if I start loading myself up with amphetamine, I'll get paranoid in my thinking. So these are things that can happen. Hallucination can happen with people on the stress. Stress-related hallucinations prior to falling asleep or waking up happens a lot, even to a student. Thinking, again, thinking, movement. What, what is there being about that? These are all functions of the brain. Negative symptoms, losing feelings and becoming withdrawn. Social changes. These are all symptoms of the brain. So here's a question for you. What do you think can cure a condition called schizophrenia? If you understand what schizophrenia is, could it be using the drug? It doesn't create a cure, it will create stability. So it works. Gene modulation might be more arguably a cure for the future. Of course, if you really want to go back to the old days, then a lobotomy will cure. But that's not on my list, but I'm not advocating it. So here, Folks, I really want to challenge you to answer these questions. If anybody can tell me where you think the mind is outside of the brain, what do you think is mental state? What is mental? Mental comes from an old Latin term, mentality, which is the mind. Again, you're going back to the mind. Where's the mind? In the brain, in your prefrontal part. Where's the psyche located? Psyche. Psyche is again like, you know, you talk about psychotherapy. Another very big term that reflects the function of the brain. So here it is the brain is the organ, all mental health disorders, all mental illnesses are coming from the brain. We can identify them, we could show the PET scans, we're going to get more advanced. Whilst the system of magnetic imaging is getting more advanced, we continue to stay in a retarded way. You know, that's what we are doing to ourselves. So I challenge us that we need to find a new name for this condition. Um, and here's the one that uh, the Taiwanese produced, and it's called the one that I like. Uh, it's called a dysfunctional thought and perception. It's got a Taiwanese sound to it. So we won't use it again because we create another stigma. But we call people by in that in those 
in the language, from why don't we think about changing this condition to what is more modern, the neurobiological disorder of genetic origin. Let's think about those young people who are going to suffer with this thing. There was such a change in the way people, there were studies done on that change of mental retardation to intellectual disability. It was shown then that the, the families, they were much, much less stressed. Though they got stressed to hear that the um, diagnosis for the child, but they were much less stressed when they heard the doctor say, your child has a problem with the neurodevelopmental delay. There's a neuro versus, oh, I have to tell you, your child is mentally retarded. Imagine how you would feel as a parent hearing those two terms. And while it's both and not good, one is absolutely vast, you know, horrific. So here's a term that they are proposing the Taiwanese, and they are now apparently in the process of making that name change in their law books or in their statutes or wherever they're doing it. So I really want us to move along those lines. Let us not only think about the term schizophrenia, let's think about all those words that I mentioned. Let us let us look at those brain areas that are covering psychiatric disorders. It's emotional, it's uh, cognitive. We know the areas involved. We see uh, cognitive is in the frontal lobe. What are the conditions that are coming out of the frontal lobe? Your psychosis, your dementia, the limbic and emotional system, you got your anxiety disorders and depression. So we can identify the areas of origin. What are we so shy about? to say we know where it's coming from. Well, why are we making people so confused? So there are behavioral problems that people have, lifestyle problems, addiction disorders, they are in the brain. When the brain is addicted, it's craving for that drug. You gotta fix the problem in the person's brain. You have to sit in dark, you, you, you touch on some very good points, and I do hope that your, your mission will come true and that you will get that, uh, those changes Again, in these, so the personality disorders, they also part of the brain function, influenced by memories, developmental issues. So with that, I want to close. Thank you very much. Um, give you a little time to ask. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. And Dr. October, if I can invite you up. To have a seat. We certainly do have time for questions. They both gave us a compelling, compelling advocacy and awareness presentation, leaving us with um challenge to come up with solutions because they told us what to do. <laughs> they really did in a very narrative, scientific, and informed way. The floor is now open to questions. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Sharma, Dr. October. This is just so tiny. I am a social worker by profession. As a matter of fact, a social worker with a policy level. Uh, I ended up in the clinical setting by objection because I came from social work at a policy level when it was time to be placed in the field. I was told I had to go to child care and protection. But I objected. I said, I'm not interested in working in, with families to that level. So the only alternative I had was to go through mental health. This was like almost 30 years ago. As a result of the social work, we ended up in the community, and I must say fat rock. It took me literally 12 years working, doing reports to really grasp the DSM, to master the DSM. And that was a requirement. So all those years, I am working, I'm writing reports, and I did not master the art. And I recall 12 years later, having a professor who said, looked at us graduate students, laughed at us, and we thought we were on top of the world. It was going to take y'all 10 years to figure it out. It took me 12. And I remember him. I said, this is what he's talking about now. So, I take also the role working in Guyana as a practitioner for 10 years, not having any voice literally in the academic community to bring the data from the field to do the 
analyzing and with interpretation, I was forced now to reach out to my peers outside of Guyana. There was a serious disconnect. So as a practitioner, I place a strong value on the particular role that I play, technical role. But as a technician in any field, it needs to be interpreted. So if you have your person or your doctoral at that level speaking in space, here in Diana, I object and advocate single-handedly and responsible for that master's program at UG because they have bachelor social workers teaching bachelor social workers. You can never teach a course more than you know. So you see, so we have a long way to go. The next thing in my uh, that I like about your season is that is look, psychiatry became a critical role. It is my only training I had to depend on looking at psychopathology. Understanding the difference between symptom and sign that when a client comes before me, they present it. We understand symptoms, we understand signs. I even have to turn to the person in the environment as another instrument to help me understand. So we've got a long way in terms of training. Dr. October, I'm going to continue one breath to give other persons an opportunity. You spoke of the substance abuse model. I I'm 11 3 through, I think it was the University of San Diego, substance abuse software. I went into a program in Sacramento that taught us when you're in addiction and the family is at risk, teach that family to function in addiction. Find out who the adult is and work with the adult. The adult might be the eight year old child. So it was a radical model. So I had that kind of exposure. Now in Diana, I applied some of that radicalism into my practice. Substance abuse, I don't talk about because there are too many other issues like poverty showing up and violence in our community. So not saying that it's not important, but it is a culture. You go into the home, the mother drinking, the father drinking, at school, I went to school as a nine year old in the thing that carried the carrying vodka. You hear me? That 10 year old in the bottle, the headmistress, she don't know what's going on. So, when you look at our culture, that how alcohol is used, then we have to say here in the Yano, where do we do focus? You see, because we have to get these people functioning. So, to understand, and I love this because it gave me an opportunity. To engage with you and say to you, hello, things happening in the field. And I've got the data to support it because day one I started collecting. So here is an opportunity because we don't get that. As far as social workers going, you mentioned social workers going into agencies and there are no field educators to guide those social workers to report back into the institution. They don't know what to look for because the capacity is not there. I am the only field educator, thanks to Buffalo State University School of Social Work, that's a field educator in Diana and I'm underutilized so, by the university. Thank you. Dr. You have some I just want to quickly say um, thank you to Mr. Ramreko. He's a powerful mental health advocate in the UK. He just sent through a message. In the chat room that he enjoyed this session very much and um he's promoting the advocacy for change of the terminology and I, i'm glad you mentioned the whole thing about addiction in terms of a biological concept because a lot of people think of it as it's just a weakness of the person but we got doctors and lawyers people are not going to meet people who became doctors and lawyers getting addicted to your point dr shaman to your point um i want to say two Two things that are important. The term now is no longer substance abuse. Mm -hmm. That's why I use substance use disorder. You, you never heard me say substance abuse. The new term is substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. And that's the work on the whole stigma and all of that. Because when you think of abuse, it has that negative connotation. So it's substance use disorder, the other thing. With respect to addiction being a disease of the brain. We cannot just look at the other factors that an individual or a family might be facing because 
like Dr. Sharma just emphasized, the brain is affected. So truly, if you try to look at the other aspects and not look at the substance use disorder, you're not really making any inward. You have to find ways to work with the families, with work with the individuals to arrest that substance use disorder so that that person can come uh, <laughs> someone, I'm using that phrase loosely, right? Um, to really get a better understanding of that person's work. Because we have to look at the person and not so much degrade them because of their behavior. We have to understand that there are lawyers, doctors, professionals who are stricken by substance use disorders. The substance use disorder does not make them a bad person because these individuals are our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, our family members that we know them differently. So it makes sense to look at that substance using behavior mm -hmm. so that we can get back to that family member that's actually. I had an attorney who was one of top attorneys in Jamaica, when I was in university hospital. And he went down, he was cocaine addict and alcohol, and he went down. To the point where the nurse who would abuse him when he showed up and the ward brought by family. Like, who did you look at you? You're the daughter, you know. I would tell him, no, this guy is remember who he was, and he will come back to mm -hmm. be a powerful attorney again. And so not the, the demeaning of individuals is something that we have to stop. And it comes from judging them by their behavior not judging them by the disorder. We don't judge people when they have physical illnesses. We, we kind of very understanding, we're very sympathetic, you know. I always remember the story that I heard that you go in the psychiatry ward where people are suffering with depression and so on, psychosis, they don't see you, it's very quiet. We go in the medical ward or ward with you know, medical patients, you see flowers, you see family bringing gifts, chocolates and good juices. You don't think that they, they don't even want to come and see it. So it's it's very negative towards the behavior. If you start seeing it as a physical condition, the brain will make a change. And I just want to give another important point here as a nugget of knowledge. Personally, in the classroom and working in the field, I never call someone an addict. Mm -hmm. I would say, and the literature is also showing now, or in terms of using uh, uh, different um, ways of describing what a person is, it is someone who's challenged that substance use disorder, or somebody who is dealing with substance use disorder. Because think of it, there is a negative connotation when the word addict is used, when the word alcohol is used. Yeah, you're right. Like said, it could be any of us. Would we want to be called an addict? Not all. Would we want to be called an addict? So I want to encourage you to embrace those terms. Someone who is dealing with alcohol itself, or someone who is. Some people might say it's semantics, but I really think it's preserving the relationship that you would have with that person. If that person decides, to call himself or herself an addict or an alcoholic, that's fine. They have to deal with how they see themselves, you know, to get themselves better. But I'm saying as well as professionals or professionals, let's look at the individual who is challenged by substance use disorder or challenged by Wow. Thank you. Thank you, top presenters who demonstrating a model for us an engaging conversation and integrated and congruent conversation that's exactly what we have here. And I we're out of time. There's one minute left. Is there any the parts in my that are clear? Um is there a question in the back? Yes. Yes. Um the first thing that I noticed that we were talking about um okay, there should be an opportunity to speak high school for any school to learn about um education part. Mm -hmm. Do you know that there is now a family life education program that is not in the school mm -hmm. and included a lot of topics for kids to play from these um various issues about 
we may we turn some things to my sleep and in the same life of the assembly. So there are not problems. How consistent is it throughout the school system that I'll talk to you? But that's my point. We can't laugh and stop. You get what I'm saying? If we are going to do it, we need to start it off in a way that it is consistent. Because remember to bring modeling for children. Because if a child goes to this school and they get it, and then they have to go to another school and they don't get it, what are we teaching the child? So, and that's why I said, um, and I, I know you want to say something else, but I just wanted to make this quick point. But that's why I said, we need to do a hard launch in making sure that everyone in every facility that has to hear about this launch, hear it, feel it, and do it. Um, the agent that you program is talking to me. It's supposed to happen in most schools, for all schools. I suspect the schools that are in the in and out of all my years may not necessarily have a senior Um, You mentioned that the Phoenix program that is creating these students. In schools like Phoenix, it is restricted to the use of terms that the students have been using. Oh, that is the way to see the WR. You can cite the topic of the WR. For the same reason, the those students might have skills in other areas. Yes, what the program says in one of the programs is not that it's being advanced in the area. Yeah, but you know, the point that you're making is a bigger systemic problem because we know that there are not systems in place to really do that internship connection, that memorandum of agreement, the way that it should be done between, say, for example, Phoenix um, Recovery Project and the school and UG, right? Now, I did mention that I found out that it's a very soft kind of arrangement for internships right now that UG has with other agencies. And I didn't put this in there. But what I also found out was that there is a lot, there's a very strong connection between the, the agencies that deal with family and children for internship with the social work program at UG and the sociology program. So to your point, I think the ad hoc arrangement is just a way that Phoenix is trying to help along. That's what I that's what I determined. However, it's not the best system in place. There, well, there is no system in place. Let me put it that way. There needs to be systems in place to do this. But at the same time, and I did say but, we need to think about the specialized track because we cannot teach a student one course in addiction and expect him or her to go into the field and do the internship based on what. This is a very, listen, mental health, is a standalone. Substance use disorders, that's another standalone. We need to have specific tracks at UG that address mental health and that address substance use. They can marry up somewhere along the way depending on how the curricula are developed. But these are specialized areas that we're talking about and without the proper education and training. I did mention that in my presentation, we can be playing with people's lives in a very, very detrimental way. Wow. Talk about agents of change. I want to thank our presenters. I want to thank our online community and your wonderful comments in the chat. I want to thank our audience members. We will say, Substance use instead of substance abuse. That's right. We will say uh, dysfunction of the thought yeah. instead of schizophrenia. We will say death by suicide yeah. instead of commit suicide. Yeah. We are agents of change and body right here. Yeah. And hopefully, we'll go forward with what we learned. Yeah.